Welcome, this is Majesty's Sussex Report, your destination for full coverage of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex visit to Columbia, a partnership between Archwell Foundation and the Office of the Vice President of Columbia. Day three is in full force on its way. We will be covering day two today. But before we start with day two, let's have a little flashback at day one. scared and uncertain and I think one of the solutions to that is education and awareness because it's becoming <clears throat> it's becoming harder and harder to stem the flow from the source and therefore really it comes down to all of us to be able to spot the true from the fake um, of course in an ideal world um, those in positions of power responsibility and influence would be more responsible and take more accountability for, 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 for spotting these things. Con la niñez, la juventud y sus padres de familia. Thank you for the question and thank you all so much for being here tonight and taking so much of your time to listen to these panels. I hope you feel as inspired as I do and I think that leads right into your question, which is part of our goal when my husband and I founded the Artful Foundation and had our own lived experience, which a lot of you may have witnessed in terms of what online harms can look like. We knew that in finding a solution, and as my husband often refers to the root cause, that has to start with people that have a level of digital literacy, that they are living in and out every day. Now, whether that's by choice or because it's being pushed to them so constantly, they become experts in this field. And so So here we go, day two. On the second day of their visit to Columbia, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan, with host Vice President Francia Marquez, began at the Colegio La Giralda. The Bogota School, located in the town of Santa Fe, is part of the list of, guess what? Guess what? 10 best schools in the world. Yes, 10 best schools in the world. According to the World's Best School Prize 2024, the most prestigious educational awards in the world, which brings together more than 200,000 teachers in over 100 countries. So what is this award all about? Well, the World's Best School Prize are a prestigious global recognition that honors the world's most outstanding educational institutions for their innovation and excellence in various fields. Created by T4 Education, an organization dedicated to improving education through collaboration and knowledge sharing among us. This award celebrates the achievements of schools have demonstrated an exceptional commitment to educational improvement, promoting healthy lives, environmental sustainability, equality and, inclus in, and inclusion. By highlighting practices and encouraging the exchange of ideas, the world's school prizes 
seek to inspire other schools internationally to raise their standards and contribute to the holistic development of their communities. There is so much I would like to say right to now. The people who have been on television, social media, talking about how awful Colombia is, dangerous, drugs, terror, and all this other stuff. Hmm. Wow. One of the best top 10 schools. And as a matter of fact, Colombia has two in the top 10. So not just this one, there's another one also. But I digress. I should just concentrate on topic. Colegio La Giralda will also be competing in the category of comprehensive well-being among its students um, to its socio-emotional gymnasium. This innovative pedag pedagogical <laughs> let me let me say that word again. Pedagog I I can't. I can't pedago. She called pedagogic. I, sh I should be able to say this. I've said it a gazillion times in Peter's College. Pedago okay, you folks know what I, me I mean. Um, pet pedagogic. Okay, Antonio, move on. Um, yes, has managed to reduce conflicts and foster resilience among the 1,400 students who are in a um, in in a context of of social vulnerability. In the gym, we work on emotions, how to manage them for ourselves and for others. Interaction with classmates has been incredible since we have solved conflicts that I didn't think was possible to resolve, said Tanya Orozco, a student at La Giralda. This comprehensive approach includes physical activities that also link socio-emotional learning, achieving a 67% reduction in school um, coexistence problems and maintaining dropout rates below 1%. This, this sort of um, the encouragement and the development of, of social emotional skills so that students can resolve conflicts and and and, and problems effectively, um, the the educational strategy of the of the Colegio de Giralda aligns perfectly with the mission of R12 Foundation, led by Prince Harry and uh, Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, which which seeks to promote mental health and create. Um, safe digital spaces. So this is, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, it was important for them to visit this um, school also. And did you folks see the, the, there's a video or clip with Prince Harry doing a little shimmy, a little bit of a move there. I, I, you know what, I don't know if I have it, but if I have it, it will be inserted as I'm speaking right now. So it was kind of, it was kind of cute. And they seem to really be having a great time. And the kids, oh, the little, the little ones are just like yummy. The glasses the that um, the Duchess just took a really cute liking to, uh, they were just like, you know, buddies. And I think I saw on social media, um, Megan having similar reading glasses as the little kid. So... Just, just precious. I just loved all of it. The afternoon, the agenda continued with a visit to the Vet Veterans and Inclusive Rehabilitation Center, where they met with the Invictus Games team from Colombia. This initiative, created by Prince Harry 10 years ago, 
recognizes the sacrifice and determination of wounded servicemen and women. Team Colombia, made up of veterans and active members of the security forces, has achieved an impressive total of 53 medals in their participation in the Invictus Games in Germany last year. They are now preparing to compete in Canada at the 2025 Winter Invictus Games. I'm sure a lot of them have not seen snow, so that's going to be that's going to be fun. Yes, the Invictus Games is for veterans, wounded or injured. This will be our second time we will, we will attend. We are representing the country. The expectation is, is high as part of the Colombian delegation. But most of us have never seen ice, well, snow. Many of us have not been so far away as to Canada, to a place so far but we have great aspirations and we are very motivated. The situation is that it's winter sports. That's kind of different from summer sports. We did really well in the summer ones. So expectations are very high for us right now. But the truth really is the sporting spirit. And above all, the Invictus staff, they are so incredible. They're so nice. Being there with other service men and women from around the world, that's the spirit. It's such great joy. Madam Vice President, I'd like to wrap up the panel with you asking you, how do we construct that Colombia that we deserve? What is the role of technology to build that future that we deserve here in Colombia? Well, technology, these tools are things that are constructed or built by humans, right? They're not built by themselves. They're built by someone. They are privileged men, men of the elite, who build these things. And when there are problems that come up, they all wash their hands of it. Now, the technology is not the problem. The problem is actually, why was the technology built? Why was it invented? With what purpose? We don't talk about the companies. Behind those companies, they pretend as if there's no one there, that, there's, that, that the company is responsible, but there are people. I'll tell you in my experience, fighting the mining industry that wanted to take away our land and dispose us from our land, they will pretend that there is not a person behind the company making those decisions. Behind everything, there's a person making decisions. So when I refer to that the problem is the human being, I'm talking about that person. I'm not talking about the general public, I'm not generalizing, but they are human beings, the people who are making decisions for all of us. They're the ones creating these tools without asking us whether we want it or need it or not. Now, the question is, why is it being invented? With what purpose? Now, this morning with the young people, they were also indicating that a lot of the technology seems to be there to manipulate, to dominate, to subdue, uh, and, and to be quite frank, to, to generate addiction, right? To, to misinform. And that's, that's coming from the young people who in many ways recognize that. There's always a person behind. Second, secondly, I like to... Um, express, manifest my experience. 
I don't want to point fingers to all the the all of the media, but I've had some awful negative um, media experiences with almost all of these mediums of communication. There's so many headlines that they put towards me. None of the headlines are good. Every headline that comes out is wrong, is bad, and they treat me as if I'm not even a human. They always show or say that I'm incapable over and over again. That concept that I am incapable, that I cannot, that I don't know, that I don't have knowledge, that I'm not intelligent. I've been hearing that since I was a kid because I'm a black woman. To black people, they, they have dehumanized us. They've told us over and over that we are not able, we're not capable of doing anything. Today, today that is being expressed open, open widely in, 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 in headlines, on, on newsstands, on television stations. Of course, I don't want to generalize everyone, but it's happening more and more. They cannot tolerate that a black woman is part of the government of this country. I always denounce it. I don't, I don't shut up. I'm never going to shut up. When I, when I confront um, racism head on and I speak up and speak out loud about it, then they use that typical stereotype of saying I have a complex, that I, I have a chip on my shoulder, that I'm, I'm basically imagining things. So it's very difficult because every time when we're asking for our dignity to be respected, then they tell us that we have a complex, that it's something is wrong with us, not with them. I would like communication to be transparent, but it's not transparent. A lot of information that has been published about me, that has been said about me, it's completely false and it's always negative. And the consequences of this, as Prince Harry was saying, it has an enormous impact on the population. I'm so happy you folks are here. I'm so happy that, that, that we're doing this because it creates dialogue. We need to have more dialogue. And we can't just have them here in the academic um, area. I want to say thank you to the head of this university, Bridget. I know that as a trans woman, to come here to be the leader of this university is, hasn't been easy. I know you have suffered violence but when I see you here being the leader of this great institution, it gives me hope. It tells me that something is changing. It may be taking long. This morning, when the young people were asked, what did they like of the technology? What makes them afraid? What makes them afraid of the technology? And they responded, many of them said that we love it because we can do research, we can find out things, we can learn so much, we can do innovation. But then they said, I'm so afraid of it though. Almost all of us, that the, the, we're so afraid of it, is that we, we may lose our, our, our family, that we're losing how we connect with each other, that we lose how we connect with our family, with our friends, and it really scares us it, that, that, that it's changing rapidly. This is the essence. This is the essence of what I'm talking about. How can we do this? How can we change it? Well, we have a challenge ahead of us. In the Ministry of Equality and Equity, we have a great, great job ahead of us. Look, historically, um, vulnerable populations, excluded populations in our country, they, they're even way more behind. We need to have a transformation that is cultural. We have to work hard, really hard in transforming our society culturally to actually recognize humanity. To actually, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter what, how you identify. 
gender, um, sexuality, independent of any of that, of independent of, of your nationality, you are a human being. That's what we need to focus. You're a human being. We're all humans. Thank you. such an important conversation um you know if we go back to the beginning of this episode when prince harry was talking about ai right and and ai is 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 one of those things like in the in the industrialized era it's it's going to fundamentally it already has started but fundamentally change everything. And for the Sussexes to be on top of this is absolutely incredible. One of the things that I admire, I love so much about these two people is they don't run around speaking in platitudes. They actually, I think the perfect example is with the parents network what was it about a year year and a half almost two years perhaps when in new york for many of us were introduced to the parents and this issue was brought even more so into the light and we find out that it's not that the sussex has just met these parents they had been working with them for a year and trying to work also with these social networks. And what they've done since then, so they worked with the parents for a year, 
they went they went basically micro, right? Because they do they they sort of do these things are depending on the issue either micro or macro so they pick which one is going to have the most impact and how they can possibly you know make it have that impact so they went micro they they understood the issue they did their research they met with the people they met with the parties involved what can we do how can we impact they decided to bring it now into main, I don't want to call it mainstream, but for the rest of us to, to get involved. So they had that um, impactful mental health um, um, seminar. And, you know, months have passed, maybe a year has passed or so. And it's not like they dropped the issue. Now they introduced to us the parent network. Uh, you see how incredible these people are? They're not running around saying they're going to solve world hunger. They're not running around saying they're going to solve crisis in the Middle East. They're not running around saying they're going to solve the homeless um, um, issue. They actually build the foundation before they even come and announce anything to the rest of us to say, hey, by the way, we bought the land, we built the foundation, and next, a house is going there. So we're going to say, get in the wood. This is, that's what they do. And I didn't even realize this until today. Like a lot of the things that they've done while in, whilst in Colombia is actually being in partnership with the, with the vice president's um, office. So it's not Columbia f putting the bill for, for some of these things. It's, it's in collaboration with and with other organizations. And it's really important, I think, because remember this trip, I think, has been being planned for about a year, that the Global South, and this is on the Archford Foundation website, the Global South has the largest increase in population, right? Like rapidly increasing. Actually, let me let me just look, look it up here and I'll, I'll I'll read what they said because it's 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 important. I wanted to get to the part where it's about uh, um, uh, teenagers in. Actually, I'll just read this part. Um, Latin American teenagers check social media an average of sixty-seven times a day, compared to global average of 45 times some some of the stuff that is people may not realize is that traffickers and i mean all types of traffickers including that of people and sex use social media and if we look at the impact that social media has in countries that are determined or called developed countries, if their teenagers are having all these issues and they have, they have more resources available to them, imagine what it's doing or, or, or the potential of what, what, what it can do even more with countries that may not have the same type of resources and ec economic cloth, clout to, 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 to do anything. Because when you are in situations, right? I mean, I've watched documentaries. I, I, I have been to countries where, you know, you, you start to have these questions in your head where you're, we're going, is, is that person, that looks like a really young person to be. And when you find out that some of these people go to these small villages and promise parents, oh, we're going to get your daughter or your son, whatever, you're going to get them a nice job in the city. Oh, they're going to be working as a babysitter. Oh, they're going to be working in a house for a nice family. 
And then that's not what they're, they're doing. And in Latin America, where, where, you know, communication as, 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 as the, as the teenagers were, where they were saying, and it, it, it speaks to the culture. It's a very sort of con connected culture in regards to, you know, and I'm going to mean connection. I don't mean like technology connection, but the, the, the type of friends you have, you know, the, the, the family connections, being together, all that is very important. And that's one of the things that, as the vice president said, those teenagers are worried about losing. And I hope they don't. Right? That they can put that technology away because it's very important to still have those bonds. But when you start to be isolated, like many are in 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 developed countries, quote unquote, because your entire existence in the world now has become virtual and it's all just you and your computer, you and your laptop, you and your you and your phone. And you're not making any real connection because everything is so detached. Everything is so transactional. Look, I can go on some more about this because I did went on some more about it. This is the third take. I'm trying to wrap this up. The first take was um, 45 minutes long. I just talked and talked and talked. I had a lot to say. And the second take, uh, let me see how much that was. That was 30 minutes long. My ambition is to make this less than 10. So I'm going to shush now. And um, my apologies for this going up so late. I had planned to get it done sooner, but um, I had to, I wasn't at my laptop or anything like that. I had to um, go help do some stuff and, uh, you know, family first. <laughs> so I had to get to do that. And I didn't get back to my home until quite late uh, when I started to work on this. But it's going to be up now. Thank you, folks. And I um, want to start working on day three, day tres. And uh, I, I'm, I don't know. I love them. I love them. I really, no, no, no. I'm not going to get, in, get into that rant because I, I did it already on the other two that I'm not going to post. Okay, ciao. Speak to you folks later.